The Mystery of the Hidden House by Enid Blyton. Bets and Pip were in the playroom, waiting for their friends Larry and Daisy to arrive. It's today that Fatty's coming back. I'm so glad. That's the sixth time you've said that in the last hour. Can't you think of something else to say? No, I can't. Oh, Pip, here comes Larry and Daisy. I expect they'll come to the station to meet Fatty too. Of course they will, and I bet old Buster will turn up as well. Fancy Fatty going away without Buster Dog. Larry, Daisy, Fatty, Pips and Bets call themselves the Five Find Outers and Dog because of Buster. They had been very good indeed at solving all kinds of peculiar mysteries in the various holidays when they came back from boarding school. Mr. Goon, the village policeman, had done his best to solve them too, but somehow the five find-outers always got a little ahead of him, and he found this very annoying indeed. Perhaps some mystery will turn up when Fatty comes. He's the kind of person that things always happen to. He just can't help it. I hope so. It was funny him not being here over Christmas. I've kept him his present, though. So have I, Daisy. I made him a notebook with his name on the cover. Frederick Trotville. See? Although Frederick was his real name, Fatty preferred the shortened version. I bought him this. It's a false beard. <laughs> to help him in his disguise. What do you think? It's a lovely one. He really is most frightfully clever at disguises, isn't he? Do you remember how he dressed up as Napoleon Bonaparte last holes? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a super mystery we solved last holes, too. I hope one turns up this time. Anyone seen our friendly local policeman, Mr Goon, lately? Oh, clear off, you mean? Yes, I saw him on his bike yesterday. I was just crossing the road, and he nearly knocked me down. And what did he say? Hmm, let me guess. Clear off? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> just then, Mrs Hilton, Pip's mother, popped her head round the door. Aren't you going to the station to meet Frederick? The train's almost due. Gosh, yes, look at the time. Come on, he'll be there before we are if we don't hurry. Well, where is he? Perhaps he's in one of his disguises to test us. I bet that's it. But who? Which one is Fatty? Oh, there he is! See? That boy over there! Yes, that's old Fatty. Not such a good disguise as usual, though. I mean, we can easily spot him this time. I know. Let's pretend we haven't spotted him. We'll let him walk right by, and then we'll walk behind him and call to him. Yes, we'll do that. Here he comes. Now, pretend not to know it's Fatty. He hasn't taken any notice of us at all. He stopped. What's he doing now? Blowing his nose by the looks of it. That's how Mr Goon blows his. Isn't Fatty clever? He's waited for us to go up to him. Don't let's. We'll just walk close behind him. What's the big idea? You think you're my shadows or something? You clear off! His disguise is better than ever. You wouldn't know it was Fatty. Let's tell him we know it's him. Hey, Fatty, we know it's you! Who do you think you are calling me Fatty? If you don't clear off, I'll tell my uncle, and he's a policeman, see? Oh, Fatty, stop being somebody else. We know it's you. Look, I've got you a notebook for Christmas. Here. What's all this? Following me around, calling me names. You're all potty. And with that, the boy walked off haughtily. To the surprise of the others, he took the wrong road. The way he went led to the village, not to the Trotville house. They followed the boy at a good distance, and then, to their amazement, he turned in at the gate of the house where Mr Goon, the policeman, lived. They stood watching Mr Goon's house for a while, 
and then turned to go back. They hadn't gone far when they heard barking. It was Buster, Fatty's dog. A lady was coming down the road after him. It was Fatty's mother, Mrs. Trotville, who told them that Fatty had telephoned to say he'd missed the train and was getting one fifteen minutes later. And into the station she went, with all the children following her. The train drew in. People leapt out. And Bets suddenly gave a shriek as she saw Fatty, who wasn't even in disguise. The four children looked very foolish. They remembered all that they'd said to the other boy. Was it possible that it hadn't been Fatty after all? Well, it couldn't have been, of course, because here was Fatty arriving on the next train. Hello, Fatty. We've just made complete idiots of ourselves. We thought you might be in disguise. So when a plumpish boy got off, we thought it was you. <laughs> and then we called him Fatty. He went to Mr Goon's house. He said old Clear Wharf was his uncle. Gracious, you put your foot in it properly. Goon has got a nephew too. It's a great pity. He must have thought you very rude. Now Mr Goon will probably complain about your behaviour again. But Mother, can't you see that... Don't begin to argue, Frederick. It seems to me that you will have to explain to Mr Goon that the others thought his nephew was you. Yes, Mother. And on no account are you to start a feud against this boy. No, Mother. And I do want you to keep out of any mysteries or problems this holidays. Yes, Mother. Don't say yes, Mother, and no, Mother, like that, unless you mean it. No, Mother. I mean, yes, Mother. Can the others come to tea? Certainly not. You must unpack, and then your father will be home. Yes, Mother. Can the others come round later, then? I've got their Christmas presents. Oh, that reminds me. I gave that boy the present I made for you, Fatty. Don't worry. I'll get it back. Just remember, there's to be no feud with this boy. Yes, Mother. That evening, Mr Goon called round to Mr and Mrs Hilton, Pip and Bet's parents, to complain to them about the treatment of his nephew. He also came to say he would be glad if none of the five led his nephew into any trouble. He didn't want him mixed up in any mysteries or anything like that. Then, after Mr. Goon had gone, Pip and Bet's father told them that he was forbidding them to try and solve any mysteries these holidays. Mrs. Hilton said that Mr. Goon had already been to Larry and Daisy's parents, and they had said they too would forbid their children to get mixed up in any mysteries. When Mr. Goon went to Fatty's house, however, it was a different story. Fatty talked his mother and father over to his point of view under the very nose of Mr. Goon. I've been very useful indeed to Inspector Jenks, Mother. You know I have. And you know I'm going to be the finest detective in the world when I grow up. I'm sure if you ring up the Inspector, he will tell you not to forbid me to do anything I want. I'm sure he'll say Mr. Goon is wrong. He trusts me. Inspector Jenks was a great friend of the children's. He was chief inspector in the next town, in charge of the whole district. Mr. Goon was in great awe of him. The children had helped the inspector on many occasions in the way they tackled various mysteries. Oh, uh, uh, don't you bother the inspector, Mrs. Trotville. He's a busy man. I wouldn't have come to you if it hadn't been for this young nephew of mine. Nice fellow he is, and I don't want him led into all sorts of dangers, see? I'm sure Frederick will promise not to lead him into danger. It's the last thing he would want. Fatty said nothing. He was making no promises. He had a kind of feeling that it would be good for Mr Goon's nephew to be led into something if he was as simple and innocent as the policeman made out. Anyway, all this was just to make sure that the five find-outers didn't solve another mystery before Mr Goon did. Fatty could see through that all right. The five find-outers met at Fatty's the next day. Buster gave everyone a hilarious welcome. Now, he barked, we're all together again. That's what I like best. But four of them, at least, looked gloomy.
That spoil sport of a Mr. Goon. We were just waiting for you to come home and find another mystery to solve, Fatty. Now we're forbidden even to look for one. All because of that goofy nephew of Mr. Goon's. Well, I'm going to do exactly as I've always done. Look for a mystery, find my clues and suspects, and solve the whole thing before Mr. Goon even knows there's anything going on. Yes, but we want to share it. Well, I don't suppose anything will turn up these holes at all. Can't expect something every time, you know. But it would be rather fun to pretend we're onto something and get Goon's nephew all hot and bothered, wouldn't it? That's a wizard idea! If we can't find a mystery ourselves, we'll make one for that boy. That'll serve Mr. Goon right for trying to spoil our fun. Let's see if we can find him. I'd be interested to see what sort of a fellow you mistook for me in disguise. Must be jolly good looking, that's all I can say. (laughs) They all went to the village. They were lucky because just as they came in sight of Mr. Goon's house, his nephew came out wheeling his uncle's bicycle. He stopped when he saw them, and to their surprise, he grinned. Hello. I know all about your mistake yesterday. I told my uncle and he spotted it was you. He said you were cheeky toads. He said you called yourself the Find Airs. What's your name? Ern. Ern? That's what I said. Pardon? I said, it's what I said. Oh, he means it's what I said. It's what I said, innit? Well... I hope you have a nice holiday with your uncle. Oh, my uncle. His high and mighty nibs. Says I mustn't get led into any danger by you. Well, see here, if you get hold of any mysteries, just tell me. Ern Goon. I'll show my uncle I've got the better brains than his. That wouldn't be very difficult. Well, Ern, we'll certainly lead you to any mysteries we find. You know your uncle has forbidden us to solve any ourselves, these holes. So perhaps you could take our place and solve a mystery right under his nose. Jumping snakes. Do you mean that? Love a duck. Yes, we'll provide you with all sorts of clues. But don't go and tell your uncle in case he gets angry with us. You bet I won't. Oh, and Ern, can I have back that notebook I gave you yesterday? It was meant for Fatty. Oh, I was going to use it for my poultry. What's poultry? Poultry. Love a duck. Don't you know what's poultry? It's when things rhyme like. Oh, you mean poetry. That's what I said. What sort of poetry? Um, I mean poetry, Ern. I'll recite you some. This one is called The Poor Dead Pig. <coughs> How sad to see thee, poor dead pig. When all... Look out! Here's your uncle! So long. See you later. Ern soon became a terrible bore. He lay in wait for the find-outers every day and pestered them to tell him if they'd smelt out any mystery yet. He kept wanting to recite his poetry. He shocked the five children with his very low opinion of his uncle, Mr. Goon. Ern was always bringing out dreadful tales of him. Then Fatty had an idea. For fun, they would make up a mystery for Ern and send him on a wild goose chase. They went to Pip's bedroom and began to plan. It wouldn't be a bad idea to practice a few disguises. It doesn't look as though we're going to have much fun these holidays. What about mysterious lights flashing at night? And send Ern to see what they are. And what about a robbery with loot hidden everywhere? Yes! Well, let's get down to it. The next day, Ern got a message that filled him with excitement. It was a note from Fatty. Developments. Must talk to you. Bottom of my garden, 12 o'clock. Ern arrived at the bottom of Fatty's garden and heard voices in the shed there. He knocked on the door. Come in. Thanks. Cool. I wasn't half excited when I got your note this morning. My uncle saw me reading it. Did he really? Did he say anything? He got into a rage, you know, but I soon settled there. This is a private note, I said. It's none of your business, so keep out of it. Just like that. And what did he say to that? He began to go purple, and I said, Now calm yourself, uncle, or you'll go pop. And then I walked out and came here. Most admirable. 
Now sit down. The time has come for us to ask you to do something. I am uncovering a very mysterious mystery. Cool. Did the others know? Not yet. Now listen, all of you. There are strange lights flashing at night over on Christmas Hill. Oh, have you seen them? There are rival gangs there. One is a kidnapping gang, one is a gang of robbers. Soon they will get busy. Cool. Talk about a mystery. Now the thing is, can we get going and find out who they are before they start robbing and kidnapping? We can't. We've been forbidden to get mixed up in any mystery, these holes. So have we. Yes, it's bad luck. I'm the only one who can do anything, but I can't do it alone. That's why I've got you here this morning, Ern. You must help me. You can count on me. Cool. I feel all funny. I bet I could write a good poem with this sort of feeling inside me. Yes. Well, let's get down to work first, shall we? Here's a notebook you can use. What do I put in it? Well, keep this page for clues. Write the word down. Clues. Clues. Now, on the next page, write suspects. Cool. Do we have suspects too? What are they? People who might be mixed up in the mystery. You make a list of them, inquire into their goings on, and cross them off when you find they're all right. Suspects. Why? Oh, quiet, Buster. I bet it's that uncle of yours snooping around. You in there, Ern? Told you. You'd better get him to clear off, Ern. Oh, must I? You come out, Ern. I've got a job for you to do. Ern opened the door and out shot Buster in delight. He flew for Mr Goon's ankles at once, barking loudly. Clear off! Yeah, you call your dog off! Clear off, you pestry dog! But it was Mr Goon who was to clear off, with Buster barking all the way. The five find-outers were very pleased with their little bit of work that morning and they were pretty sure that Ern would let everything out to his uncle so they would keep Mr. Goon busy too. It was decided that Larry and Pip would flash the mysterious lights on Christmas Hill and Fatty would let Ern discover him crouching in a ditch or something so that he would think that he'd happened on a robber. Disguised as an old lady so Mr. Goon wouldn't recognise him, Fatty went round to Ern's house and slipped him a note, telling him to watch for lights on Christmas Hill that night and hide by the old mill. Ern was in such a state of excitement all the rest of the day that his uncle couldn't help noticing it. He stared at Ern and wondered, what was wrong with the boy? Stop fidgeting, Ern. What's the matter with you? Nothing, uncle. Actually, Ern was a bit worried. He knew Christmas Hill all right, but he didn't know where this mill was that Fatty had mentioned in his note. He decided to get a map out of the bookcase as Mr. Goon was answering the telephone. He opened it and looked for the mill. Oh, there it is, on the right of the stream. If I follow the stream, I can't help coming to the mill. Mr. Goon's eyes looked sharply at the map Ern was studying as he came back into the room. What are you studying that map for? Uh, just looking to find a good walk. Mr. Goon knew there was something going on. He looked at the map and saw that Ern had penciled in the path to the old mill, together with a note about mysterious flashing lights. So, that's what's going on. I'll have to look into this. I'll go tonight. About half past eleven that night, Ern got up and trod quietly down the stairs, hoping not to wake up his uncle, who by this time was plodding softly up Christmas Hill. Fatty was already by the mill. Larry and Pip were some distance away, each with a torch and directions to begin shining it here and there every few minutes. The hill was a desolate place, with a cold wind sweeping across it. Mr. Goon wished he was at home in bed. He plodded along, 
and quite suddenly he saw a light flashing not far from him. What could it be? Flash, flash, flash. The lights winked out over the hill. Mr. Goon wondered if it was Morse code. Who were these signalers? Were they flashing to somebody in the mill? The mill was almost ruined with nothing there but owls and bats. The light stopped flashing. Nothing much seemed to be happening. Larry and Pip were so cold, they decided to make their way home. They would meet Fatty in the morning and hear what had happened to him and Ern. When the light stopped, Mr. Goon moved very cautiously from the hedge. Fatty heard a scraping and thought it was Ern. He crept towards Mr. Goon and decided to make a few animal noises. Fatty then wailed as loudly as he could. <coughs> Mr. Goon froze to the marrow. He was petrified. What, what, what's that? He started to run. Fatty heard the running noise and thought it was Ern, so he padded after the noise. Mr. Goon tripped over a root and fell flat. Fatty fell on top of him and, thinking it was Ern, started pummeling him. Now it was Fatty's turn to get a shock. Ow! Get off! Fatty recognised the voice. Gracious, it was Mr. Goon, not Ern. He freed himself as quickly as possible and shot off down the hill. His head was spinning. Where was Ern? Dazed by what had happened, Mr. Goon picked himself up, and he too made his way down the hill. Flashing lights, animal noises, then an attack. Something's going on, but I'll get to the bottom of it and see if I don't. And both Fatty and Mr. Goon wandered their separate ways home. Ern, meanwhile, had most unfortunately followed the wrong stream, so that it didn't, of course, lead him to the mill on Christmas Hill. Can't be right. There's no sign of the mill. No sign of Christmas Hill either. I must be going the wrong way. I'd better go back. It's too cold. I don't care what the others say. I'd better go back. Yes, that's what I... What was that? Love a duck. It's a light. Now it's gone out. What's that? Sounds like a car. It can't be. It was a car. But why didn't it have lights? Now what? Good night, Holland. See you later. Oh, I wish the others were here. This must be part of the mystery that Fatty talked about. Ern turned back and came at last to a bridge he knew and made his way quietly to his uncle's house. It took Ern a long time to go to sleep. To begin with, he was very cold and the bed wouldn't seem to warm up. And then he was puzzled by what he'd seen and heard. He thought he couldn't be a good detective. That boy, Fatty, would have guessed a whole lot of things if he'd been with Ern that night. Ern was quite sure of that. The next day, he went round to Fatty's shed, but no one was there. However, there was a message on the door. Gone to Pips. Join us there. Guessing the message was for him, he went to Pips where he found the find-outers waiting for him. Fatty had already told his friends about his adventures with Mr. Goon. Hello. And what happened to you last night? You went to sleep and didn't wake up in time to come, I suppose. I didn't go to sleep at all. I got up and followed the stream, but it didn't lead me to Christmas Hill or to any mill. I don't know where it led me to, but I saw the mysterious lights, all right. You didn't. Pip and I and Fatty were up on the hill and saw them. 
You couldn't possibly have seen any flashing lights if you weren't up on the hill. Well, I did. You weren't with me. You don't know what I saw. I must have followed the wrong stream, that's all. But I tell you, I did see a light. You couldn't have. I did. I was standing by the stream, see? And I saw this light. It just shone once and then faded. Then I heard a purring noise and a car came by somewhere. And it hadn't any lights on. It was queer. And then I thought maybe it was all part of the mystery too. Go on. Well then, after the car had gone, I heard footsteps. And then I heard one man say to another, Good night, Holland. See you later. Or something like that. And after that, I turned back and went home. Have you told your uncle this? No, of course not. He was in bed snoring. He wasn't. He was up on Christmas Hill. He might have gone without me hearing him and returned to the house before me. Yes, I suppose that's what he must have done. He must have got hold of your note. Did you tell your uncle about the men? No, of course not. Look, which mystery is the real one then? The one with the flashing lights on Christmas Hill or mine down by the stream? Or are they both real? Well, um... I suppose the mystery up on the hill is the real one. Well, Ern, um, what about you going up on Christmas Hill to see if you can find a few clues in daylight? That would be a help. What sort of clues? Oh, cigarette ends, buttons, footprints, anything like that. You never know. A real detective can usually find no end of clues. I'll go about free when Uncle's having his afternoon snooze. Well, better be going. I'll bring any clues to you if I find them. So long. What do you think, Fatty? I don't know. It seems a bit strange. Any good having a snoop along the stream? We're not allowed to. Well, it's not a mystery yet and it may never be. I think the best thing would be to go up to Christmas Hill before three o'clock and drop a nice lot of clues. Ern will find them, probably write some poetry about them, and if he hands them over to Goon, so much the better. <laughs> so in great glee, the five find outers and Buster the dog set off up Christmas Hill, taking with them what they thought would do for clues. A few hours later, Ern too went up Christmas Hill. It was a lovely afternoon, and he walked slowly, his eyes on the ground. He felt important. The beginning of a poem swam into his mind as he looked up and saw the sun sinking redly in the west. Poor dying sun that sinks to rest. Hmm, that's a good line. A very good one indeed. Poor dying sun... What's that? Looks like a piece of rag. Maybe it's a clue. And a button. Two clues already. He found a broken shoelace, a cigar end and a broken tin. And then he found a piece of paper that Pip had left with a made-up telephone number written on it. He also picked up a ragged old handkerchief that Daisy had left, which had the letter K embroidered on it. After that, he only found two more things that seemed worth picking up. One was a burnt match. The other was the stub of a pencil, which had initials cut into it at the end. E.H. With a pocket full of interesting clues, Ern set off down the hill again. When he got home, his uncle was out. Ern got himself some tea, then took out his notebook and wrote down a list of all the things he'd found. There. Look at that. Ten clues already. I'd make a good detective. Love a duck! Here's Uncle! I'd better clear this lot away. Oh, hello, Uncle. What are you doing with that notebook? Uh, nothing. What are you doing sitting at an empty table doing nothing? I I'm not doing nothing. I can see that. What have you been doing this afternoon, then? Oh, I've been for a walk. Where? Were those five kids? No, by myself. Where did you go? Up Christmas Hill. It was awfully nice up there, the view, you know. Uncle? Now look here, my boy. You're up to something with those kids, I know. Now you and me must work together. In the interest of the law, we must tell each other all the goings-on. 
What goings on? You know quite well what they are. Now you tell me what that boy Frederick told you. Fatty, he didn't... I'm going to lose my temper with you, Ern. He said that there was two gangs, that's all. Two gangs? Kidnappers was the one gang and robbers the other. Kidnappers and robbers? Go on, what next? And lights flashing on Christmas Hill. You were right to tell me, Ern, all that you heard from those kids. Now you and me can work together. And we'll soon clear up this mystery, and we'll get no end of praise from Inspector Jinks. What do you say? If you like, Uncle. Can I go out for a bit, to slip around and never talk to the others? They might have some news. All right, and uh, get all you can out of them. Ern lost no time. He pulled on his coat and fled out of the house. He was lucky enough to find all the fine doubters together in Pip's playroom. I say, I've got ten clues for you. What do you think of that for a day's work? Love a duck. It's amazing. It's impossible. It's wonderful. Let's have a look, Ern. See? A cigar end. That means someone with money. And look, we want someone with a brown coat. See this button? These will help tremendously, Ern. Will they really? I've got something awful to tell you all. What? I went and gave the game away to my uncle. You did what? He's got a terrible temper. I thought he was going to hit me. So I told him about the kidnappers and robbers up on Christmas Hill. I know I'm a coward. Well, it wasn't a brave thing to do, but Mr Goon can be frightening. He told me I must work with him. Well, there's something in that. Families ought to work together. We shan't complain any more if you pass on any news to your uncle. But I don't want to. I want you to solve things, Fatty. Not uncle. Tell us again about your little adventure, Ern. You're certain one man was called Holland. Oh, yeah. Frederick! Frederick! Oh, there's Mother, ready to go. I thought about a fine poem this afternoon. About the dying sun. Uh, we haven't got time to hear it now. Spitty. Spitty? What do you mean, Spitty? He means it's a pity. It's what I said. Ern followed the others downstairs. He slipped out of the garden door unseen and tore home to his uncle's house. A delicious smell of bacon and eggs met him as soon as he got in. Ern stood and sniffed. <sighs> oh, love a duck. Uncle was doing him proud tonight. Hurry up, young Ern. I've fried you an egg and a bit of bacon. Smells good, Uncle. Well, did you see those kids? Get any news from them? No, there wasn't any news. Well, what did they say to you? I told them you said we were to work together. You shouldn't have told them that. They said it was right that an uncle and nephew should work together. And what's more, Fatty said I took after you, Uncle. He said you pass your brains on to me. Oh, give me strength. That night, Ern went to bed early because he was tired. He fell asleep at once and did little snores very like Mr. Goon's big ones. Mr. Goon heard them and rose quietly. Now to get Ern's notebook and see what he'd written in it. Ern didn't stir when Mr. Goon tiptoed in. He slipped his hand into Ern's coat pocket and found the notebook at once. Then he noticed how Ern's trouser pockets were bulging and decided to take them downstairs and look. Now, let's see what he's written here. 
Oh, clues. Look at that. All them clues and never a word to me. What's he got in his pockets, I wonder? Well, I never. A button, a bit of cloth, and a cigar end. Expensive. Which of them have any bearing on the happenings up on Christmas Hill, I wonder? <laughs> I wonder how much Fatty knows about this mystery. Fatty, of course, knew a great deal about the goings-on up on Christmas Hill. But that wasn't the mystery he was interested in. He wanted to find out about the other mystery that Ern might have discovered. He decided it would be a good idea to follow the stream just like Ern did. Then he could have a look round to see where the light that Ern saw could have come from. So next morning he went round to Larry and Daisy and then went to fetch Pip and Betts. Buster came, of course, full of delight to think there was a walk for him. It was frosty weather, and the grass crunched beneath their feet. The little stream wound in and out, and bare willow and alder trees grew here and there on its banks. Then suddenly the stream took a left-hand bend and ran towards a dark wood. The wood was made up of evergreen trees and stood silent and still in the wintry air. It looked rather sinister. They followed the stream until they'd almost reached the wood. Not far off was a narrow lane, almost a cart track. It was so rough. Now we know a car went by not far from Ern when he stood by this stream. It seems to me it must have gone down that lane. It must lead to the road that goes to Peter's wood. Yes, and this lane must come from somewhere in the middle of the wood. Let's follow it. Good idea. Now, not a word about anything except ordinary things. And if we're stopped, seem surprised and innocent. Don't say anything we don't want people to hear. Come on, Buster. There can't be any rabbits down that hole. It's far too small. The track wound about almost as much as the stream. Buster ran ahead, his tail wagging. He disappeared round a corner, and then the children heard him barking. They ran to see why. All they saw was a big pair of iron gates set into two enormous stone posts. A bell hung at one side. On each side of the posts stretched high walls set with glass spikes at the top. They came near to the gates and then saw that there was a small lodge just beyond them. Watch these gates at all. They might be locked. I'll ring the bell, shall I? I can always make up an excuse. Yes! There's someone coming out that lodge. What do you want? Go away! You stop ringing that bell as a private, can't you see that? Oh, um, doesn't my uncle, Colonel Thomas, live here? No, he doesn't. Go with a lot of you and take the dog with you. Are you sure he doesn't live here? Well, who does then? Nobody! The house is empty. Now go away. Clear off at once. I'll set my dogs on you. Sorry to have bothered you. Um, could you perhaps tell us the way back to Peter's Wood? The children went down the lane talking quietly. They all felt sure they'd hit on their next mystery. But so far they couldn't make head or tail of it. Suddenly a man on a bicycle came riding down the lane. It was the postman. Good afternoon. Could you please tell us who lives in the house with the iron gate? Iron gate? You must mean Harry's folly. It belongs to an old gentleman who doesn't live there himself, and he asks such an enormous price for the place that nobody will buy it. Is he ever there? Not that I know of. There's a caretaker, though, namer of, um, Peters. Well, must be going now. Bye! Ern was not told anything about the walk to the wood. He wanted to know, however, what were the steps that Fatty was going to take in the mystery of Christmas Hill. Well, word has come to me that a big robbery will be done in the next few days and that the robbers on Christmas Hill will hide the loot in the old mill. Cool. The thing is, who's going to look for the loot after the robbery? I can't let the others, because they're forbidden to do things like look for loot. Cool. Fatty, why don't you let me find the loot? 
Love a duck. I could go and search the old mill for you. Well, I might let you. What about it, find outers? Yes, let him. <laughs> yes, do. When do I look for it? Tonight? Well, um, it's not usual to look for loot before the robbery has been committed, but if you think there's a chance of finding it before it's put there, you go ahead, Ernie. <laughs> yes, I see what you mean. But when will the robbery be? The papers will tell you. Look in your uncle's paper each morning. And if you want to tell him about it, we've no objection. I don't want to. Well, must be going. All right. Bye then. Bye. <laughs> Bye, Anne. Poor old Anne may have to wait weeks to look for his loot, Fatty. No, he won't. There's a robbery in the paper nearly every day. There'll be a robbery tomorrow or the next day, don't you worry. Anyway, let's get back to our mystery. We've hardly got anywhere so far. We found out that that building in the woods is called Harry's Folly, but nobody knows why, and the man who owns it lives abroad. We know that one of the men who was near the place was called Holland. Yes, I was coming to that. Where's your telephone directory, Pip? Let's see if there's any Hollands in it. I'll get it. There you are. Right. E, G, H. Here we are. Holland. A, J, Holland. Henry Holland. W, Holland and Co. Garage Proprietors Marlowe. Have to look them all up, I suppose. List of suspects. Three Hollands and one caretaker called Peters. Correct. Pip and Bet, you be responsible for finding out about one lot of Hollands. Larry and Daisy find out about the other. And I'll bike over to Marlow tomorrow and smell out the Hollands there. I think I'll go in disguise. I know. I'll go as Urn. Quite a few things happened the next day. For one thing, there was a report of a big robbery in the daily papers. Urn could hardly believe his eyes when he saw the headlines. Fatty was right. There was the robbery. Coo! Soon the loot would be in the old mill and he'd find it. He'd be a hero. Mr. Goon read about the robbery too. But he didn't for one minute think it had anything to do with Urn or himself. He wondered why Urn looked so daft that morning. Had he got any more news? No, said Urn, he hadn't. He felt guilty when he remembered how he was going to find the loot. But he wasn't going to split on Fatty any more. He was going to behave like a real find-outer. Fatty himself had set off with Buster on his bicycle soon after breakfast to Marlow. He'd made himself up just like Urn. He'd put on a wig of untidy, coarse hair, very like Urn's, an old Mac and corduroy trousers. He wished the others could see him. Holland's garage was in a road off the high street. Fatty dismounted, let the air out of one of his tyres, and wheeled his bicycle into Holland's garage, where he saw a boy about his own age washing a car. Hello. Any chance of repairing my puncture? Not just now. I'm busy. Oh, come on. Can't you do my bike? I can't do it yet, I said. I say, is that your dog in a basket? And he good? Yeah, he's a fine dog. Come on, Buster. You can get down now. <coughs> this is a big garage, isn't it? You must be pretty busy. We are. I know a bit about cars. Any chance of a job here? You'd have to ask the boss. Who's the boss? Mr. Rollin, of course. Slave driver, I call him. Oh, this is him now. Who does that dog belong to? Uh, this boy here, Mr. Rollin. What's your name? Frederick Trotville. I shall report your dog if you bring him in here again. What do you want? I came to ask if I could have my bike punch amended. I want to ride over to a place called Harry's Folly. Do you know the best way to get to it? Uh, Harry's Folly, you say? No, never heard of it. And we can't mend your bike now. We're too busy. Clear off. And take that dog with you. Fatty was sure he'd found the right Mr. Holland. He'd seen the little start the man gave at the mention of Harry's folly. He pumped up the tyre swiftly, put Buster into the basket and rode home, pleased with himself. 
Frederick Trotville, you certainly are a good detective, Fatty told himself. Back at the garage, Mr. Holland sat in his office deep in thought. He dialed a number and spoke to somebody. That you, Jack? Listen, what was the name of that kid who cleared up the missing necklace affair? Smart lad, you remember? Yes, that's the one. Well, it may interest you to know he's been here with a dog called Buster, and he told me he wanted to bike to a place called Harry's Folly. What do you make of that? <laughs> yes, I agree with you. Kids like that must be dealt with. Leave it to me. That afternoon, the find-outers were at Fatty's down in his cosy shed. He'd been telling them all his adventures of the morning. I expect Ern will be along soon. Anyone see the account of this big robbery in the papers? Ern will be sure to think it's the one we meant. I expect that's him now. Come in! Hello. What I say? You're looking at the story of the robbery. You're a marvel, Fatty, to know it was going to be done so soon. I can't think why you don't tell the police beforehand. They wouldn't believe me. Well, Ern, there should be plenty of loot up at the old mill soon. I'm going tonight. It's awfully good of you to let me, Fatty. Don't mention it. Sh pleasure. Pardon? He means it's a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> Funny way you have of talking sometimes. Ern spent the rest of the day in a state of excitement. He didn't want to go to sleep. He wanted to keep awake and leave for Christmas Hill about one o'clock. But his eyes kept closing. This wouldn't do. A thought came into his head. He would make up some portry. That would stop him going to sleep. He got out his portry notebook and his book of clues and suspects. He read the list of clues again. Then he took a pencil and wrote a few lines. Now for the portry. He read through his various poems, then shut the portry notebook and put it on top of the other one. Then he stood up to begin saying portrait straight out of his head. But somehow it wouldn't come. Ern stood there shivering. Then suddenly a line came into his head. The poor old man lay on the grass. What next? The poor old man lay on the grass. On the grass. On the... The poor old man lay on the grass. What the? Oh, it's Ern. What's he doing in the middle of the night talking about a poor old man laying on the grass? <gasps> Uncle! Now, what's all this waking me up with your poor old men, hmm? What do you think you're doing? I was only making up poetry, Uncle. Poetry? I'll teach you to wake me up in the middle of the night with poetry. What are these? Oh, Uncle, please, don't touch those. They're my books. They're private. Oh, that's what you think. Mr Goon switched off the light and shut the door, taking Ern's books with him. Ern got out of bed shivering with fright. Now his uncle would read about the loot and the wonderful secret would be out. He heard Mr Goon dress. He heard him go quietly out of the house. Ern knew he was going up to Christmas Hill. Now he'd find the loot. All Fatty's plans would come to nothing because of him, Ern Goon, and his silliness. Ern felt very small and miserable. Mr Goon, of course, didn't find any loot. Also, in the bright light of morning, he couldn't help thinking that perhaps he'd been rather foolish to rush off to Christmas Hill in the middle of the night as he had. Ern was eating his porridge when his uncle came down. They both scowled at each other. Ern didn't offer to get his uncle's porridge for him. You get my porridge and look slippy about it. Don't see why I should, the way you treat me. Serve you right if I run away. Tja, run away. Stuff and nonsense. A boy like you hasn't the courage of a mouse. Ern said nothing. He just looked sulky. Mr Goon went off on his bicycle at last. Ern slipped out of the back door to see the find-outers. He made his way through the village with his head down, muttering the first line of a new poem he was thinking of. 
The poor little mouse was all alone. A car came down the lane. Ern looked up. A man was at the wheel and another man at the back. Ern stood aside to let the car pass. It went on a few yards and stopped. Hey, boy, do you know the way to the post office? Yeah, it's down there a little way. Well, jump in and show us, there's a good lad. We've lost our way three times already. Here's 50p if you'll help us. Ern's eyes brightened at the money. Although he knew he should never, ever get into a car with a stranger, he hopped in beside the driver. You'll have to turn right at the... Here, you've passed a turning. Where are you going? You'll see. We'll show you what we do with interfering boys. Always poking your nose in, aren't you, Frederick Trotville? Thought you were clever at the garage the other day, didn't you? I'm not Frederick. I'm Ern Goon. My uncle is a policeman. Don't waste your breath. We know you all right. Ern was taken to a garage some miles from Marlow, owned by Mr Holland. He was pushed into a small room where the only light came through a skylight. Ern began to sniffle. He was no hero, poor Ern, and things were happening too fast for him. He sat there, miserable and frightened. At half past four, when it was almost dark, the door opened again and the men came in. Ern was pushed into the back of the car again. He was in despair. How could he let the others know anything? He felt in his pockets. His clues were still there, all ten of them. Supposing he threw them out of the window one by one, there might be a chance of one of the find-outers picking one up. It was a very faint hope indeed, especially as Ern had no idea where the car was going. He peered through the window. Wait a bit. They were actually going through Peterswood. He wondered if he could let down the window far enough to throw his clues out. Don't you dare open the window. But I... I feel sick, see? I want air. Let me open the window just a few inches or... or... I'll be sick all over the car. Here, here, here. I'll, I'll open it just a bit. But none of that sick business, all right? Uh, I'll try not to. Every now and then, Ern made a horrible noise and at the same time threw out another clue. He grinned to himself in the darkness. Finally, the car slowed down. Then there came the creak and clang of gates. The car moved on. It ran onto something smooth and then stood still. And then, to Ern's alarm, the car shot downwards as if it were in a lift. Well, here we are. How'd you get Frederick Trotville? This is the place you were inquiring about but you'll wish you'd never heard of. Welcome to Harry's Folly. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mr. Goon, who had got quite a nice dinner of stew and dumplings, felt most annoyed. Where was that boy? Gone round to those kids, he supposed. Spun a wonderful tale about his cruel uncle. <laughs> oh, Mr. Goon would have something to say about that. Then a very small doubt crept into his mind at that moment. Suppose Ern really had run away like he said he would. No, no, how silly. He must be somewhere with those kids. Mr Goon walked up the road that led to the post office. It was dark and he shone his torch on the ground before him. It suddenly picked something in its beam. A button with a piece of cloth attached. I know that button. It's one of Ern's clues. So, Ern's been along this way. What's that? The cigar end. 
What's Ern doing chucking his clues about like this? It's them kids again, playing a trick on me, I bet. Well, we'll see about that. Mr Goon made his way to Pip's house. Lorna, the maid, answered his knock and showed him to Pip's bedroom. Mr Goon walked in and put the clues on the table. Another of your silly tricks, I suppose. Getting Ern to chuck these things where you knew I'd find them. Oh, very childish, I must say. Where is Ern, Mr Goon? We haven't seen him all day. <laughs> Think I believe that? I haven't seen him all day either. I bet he's hidden in this house somewhere. That's aiding and abetting, that is. Where did you find these clues, Mr Goon? As if you didn't know. Where you told Ern to put them, of course. Up Candlemas Lane. What could Ern have been doing there? Don't you really know where young Ern is? No. If we did, we'd tell you, Mr Goon. Honest. Fatty, however, had an idea at the back of his mind about where Ern might be. He set out and found some more of the clues that Ern had thrown out. And two of them were along the track that led to Harry's folly. Fatty returned to his house, where the other find-outers were waiting for him. That's where I believe Ern is. Do you mean he went off to explore Harry's folly? But he doesn't know anything about that mystery. I know he doesn't. All the same, I think he's there. I think he must have been taken there. But why? Even if Holland came along in his car and saw Ern, why should he take him away? I expect he thought Ern was you. After all, you were disguised as Ern when you went over there, weren't you? And when you mentioned Harry's folly, he might have been scared, thinking you knew something. That's it! They kidnapped Ern, thinking he was me. Well, now I've jolly well got to rescue him and perhaps solve this mystery at the same time. Oh, Fatty, don't do that! Can't you just ring Inspector Jenks? No, because I might be wrong. Ern might be hiding somewhere, sulking, to give Mr Goon a fright. We'll come with you then. You can't. You're forbidden. But we're not going to solve a mystery. We're going to rescue Ern. I'm going by myself. I shall take the rope ladder to get over the wall. Then, aha, there'll be dark, dire deeds, as Ern would say. Fatty set out after dinner that night. He had with him the rope ladder, but Buster was left at home, whining. He was very angry that Fatty should have left him behind. He walked cautiously along the frosty bank of the stream. Two shadowy figures came out from behind a tree and followed him. Fatty's sharp ears caught the soft crunch, crunch behind him. The footsteps drew nearer. He heard whispers. He grinned. He knew who was following him now. Larry and Pip. They weren't going to be left out whether they were forbidden or not. They went on together, the three of them. With the rope ladder, they managed to climb the high wall and made their way through thick trees towards the house. There was not a light to be seen anywhere. They went round the house to what must have been stables or garages. A small door stood open in one of the garages, creaking in the cold night air. Come on, this door's open. Let's go into the garage. It's enormous! Yes! What's happening? The floor's just dropped away. It's a movable floor, worked by machinery. Let's hide behind those barrels and see if the floor comes back up again. Listen. Yes, I hear something. It's coming back up. There are cars on it now. All ready. You know what to do. Are you game to? There's a tow rope over there. We could climb down on that. Right. You tie it to that beam, Pip. What sort of place is this, Fratty? I'm not sure, but I rather think it's a receiving place for stolen cars. They're brought here in the dark, put on the moving floor, taken down here, and completely altered so that nobody would know them again. Then they're sent above ground again at night, and I imagine sold for a colossal sum. Phew, 
I heard my father saying the other day that the police were baffled over the amount of stolen cars lately. I bet this is where they come to. Shh! Who's that coming down those stairs? It's Mr. Holland. You men, I need to check something with you. Now's our chance. While they're all in that room, let's go up those stairs. Maybe Ern's up there. They ran quietly up the stairs and onto a wide landing. Doors opened off it, and another flight of stairs led upwards. The boys looked around at all the closed doors, fearing that one might open suddenly and somebody come out and challenge them. At that very moment, there came a familiar sound, a rather forlorn, hollow cough. <coughs> uh, Ern! I'd know that cough anywhere. It's so like Goon's. Ern is in one of these rooms. This one, I think. It's bolted. Ern! Fatty! I knew you'd come. I knew you'd follow my clues. Are you all right, Ern? They haven't hurt you, have they? No, but they don't give me much food. Larry, go to the door and keep watch. Right. Listen, Ern. Can you do something really brave? Cool. I don't know. Well, we're right in the middle of a great big mystery here. And I want to get to the police and tell them before the men are warned. Now, if we take you away with us tonight, they'll know the game is up. So will you stay here, locked up, and wait till the police come? I can't do that. I can't even think of any poetry. Aren't you brave enough to do this one thing? All right, I'll do it, see. But I don't feel very brave about it. You're a hero, Ern. The boys crept down the spiral stairway. Work was in full swing in the workshop. Mr. Holland stood with his hands in his pockets, talking to another man. The boys crouched in a dark corner, growing sleepier and sleepier. Fatty suggested that they took turns to sleep and watch. The night passed slowly. Fatty woke suddenly. It was 7 a.m. A big lorry backed almost into their corner. An idea came to Fatty. He quickly explained his plan to his friends. The boys climbed quickly into the back of the lorry. The driver started up the engine and drove out of the garage. When the lorry stopped at the gates, the boys slipped out. Meanwhile, Mr. Goon had been sitting up all night hoping Ern would come home or the telephone would ring to say where he was. When it did ring, it was Mrs. Hilton to say that Pip was missing. And then Larry's father rang to say he was missing. Finally, Mrs. Trotville reported Fatty was missing too. What with Ern being gone for two days and now three more boys missing... Mr. Goon couldn't stand any more. He telephoned Inspector Jenks, who said he'd be right over. Oh, sir, I'm so glad you've come. Pull yourself together, Goon. What's happened? Well, it all began when my nephew Ern came to stay. I warned the others not to lead into no mysteries. You know what that Frederick Trotville is, sir, for getting into trouble? First thing I know is there's a mystery up on Christmas Hill. Two gangs there... Go on. Well, I went up there one night, and now all the parents of those kids have rung up to say their boys are missing. Are you sure you've told me everything, Goon? Well, everything that's of any use. I went up the old mill after the loot, sir, but I couldn't find it. I must find those boys. I wonder where in the world they could be. Beats me. Well, I think I've found three of them. What, sir? Look, Goon, coming up the path. Come in. Inspector Jenks, you're just the person I wanted to see. I'll take you home in my car. You can tell me your story later. I already know about this uh, rather incredible mystery on Christmas Hill, Frederick. Oh, that. That's nothing, sir. I've got a mystery that'll keep you busy for the rest of the day. The Christmas Hill mystery we made up, you see to play a trick on Arn. It wasn't our fault if Mr Goon believed it too. We didn't think he'd be as silly. 
Oh, I see. Well, Inspector, Ern lost his way when he went to Christmas Hill and saw one or two queer things at Bourne Wood. That's what led us to Harry's Folly and a man called Holland. Holland? What do you know about him? Quite a lot, sir. We've been suspicious of him for a long time. He kidnapped Ern, thinking Ern was me. He's at Harry's Folly now. And that's not all. There's a workshop there, with heaps of cars being painted and done over. I think they're stolen cars, sir. So that's where it is. We've been looking for that workshop for a long time, Frederick. You remember, Goon? I reported it to you two years ago and asked you to keep a lookout in your district. And there it was, right under your nose. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Right. I'd better use the phone. Hello? Inspector Jenks here. Get six cars round to PC Goon's house in Peterswood now. We're going to Harry's Folly. We've found the stolen car workshop by the sound of it. Yes, that's correct. As soon as you can, then. And now, I'm going to take you all home. It'll be a few minutes before the police cars come along. Sir, may I just ask you one question? It's about Ern. Is he all right? Oh, Ern. Yes, he's quite all right, as far as I know. I must go with you to Harry's Folly, sir. I must rescue Ern. You wouldn't be so mean as to leave me out at the end of it, would you? <sighs> all right. You can come with me if you want to, in my car. But I may as well tell you that you won't be in the thick of it. Only a sightseer. Fatty was whipped away again in the car. Six other cars joined them and went slowly along the track to Harry's Folly. The raid was a complete and utter surprise. Every man down below in the workshop was rounded up and Mr Holland was discovered asleep in one of the bedrooms near Urn's. Urn was not asleep. He was waiting and waiting. He didn't feel he could wait much longer. He was so terribly hungry, for one thing, and he was so glad to see Fatty when he was led to the car by one of the policemen that he could hardly keep from hugging him. So, this is Urn. Hop in, lad. Quite the hero, I hear. Oh, uh, and a bit of a poet, too. Oh, thank you, sir. A very good all, Frederick. A neat little mystery and a neat ending. Thanks very much, my boy. Make haste and grow up. I want a right-hand man, you know. Right, sir. I'll do my best to grow up as soon as I can. <laughs>